אנו מכריזים בזאת על הקמת מדינה יהודית בארץ ישראל. היא מדינת ישראל. In this lecture, I want to discuss legitimacy. It was the Mapam politician Mordechai Ben Tov in the discussion of the draft on May 13th who recalled that Chaim Weizmann, and I quote uh, Ben Tov, Chaim Weizmann once said that our tragedy is that we always have to explain ourselves. Now this sort of explanation is sometimes called Hasbara. It's campaigning to win hearts and minds. and justifying one's actions in political and in moral terms. Ben-Gurion approached the declaration, at least in part, as an exercise in Hasbara, as he himself indicated before he did his last edit of the document. In the People's Administration meeting of May 13th, which was devoted to the Shertok, draft, he said the following, and I quote him, This has to be a document that includes profound, encompassing, and fundamental Zionist Hasbara, both for the Jews, because there are still many Jewish doubters, and for the non-Jews, who are not our haters. There's no place for juridical argumentation. The document has to set forth political assumptions. End of quote. Now, it is an astonishing quote. given the weight that the declaration has since been made to bear as Israel's domestic identity card, and even as a source of law. But Ben-Gurion couldn't have known that the declaration would serve so many unintended purposes. As we saw in an earlier lecture, Ben-Gurion urged the People's Council on the day of the declaration not to get tied up in the details, because it was just a declaration. Let me bring that quote again. There is no one among the compilers who thinks it's the height of perfection. But the purpose is to give just those things that, in our opinion, provide a basis for what we'll do today for the people of Israel, world opinion, and the United Nations. We're declaring independence, nothing more. This isn't a constitution. End of quote. So given this purpose, much of the drafting revolved around what worked best for external audience. Now, we've already covered one justification. The land of Israel is the birthplace of the people. Ben-Gurion made sure that that was there, although in a national rather than in a religious form. That left three other rationales. First, the sufferings of the Jews beginning with their dispersal and culminating in the Holocaust. Second, the modern achievements of the Yishuv, and third, the license given by the international community, starting with the Balfour Declaration and the League of Nations mandate, but above all, the UN resolution of November 1947. Each of these justifications has some use and some merit, but the declaration has to be short, so choices have to be made. And while these choices said much, about the sensibilities of the drafters, they also said a lot about the politics of the moment. Let's begin with the first one, the sufferings of the Jews beginning with their dispersal and culminating in the Holocaust. In the earliest drafts, the sufferings loomed large. Beham, as we have seen, was much influenced by the American Declaration of Independence. And he may well have been inspired by the list of the king's abuses and usurpations, which takes up more than two-thirds of the American Declaration. But whatever the source, his draft provided a litany of grievances. He cataloged, and I'm quoting here, the destruction of our holy temple in Jerusalem by the Roman legions, the banishment of the Jews to exile, and the loss of life and property by the hands of their many oppressors, such as no people has been called upon to endure since time began. This culminated in what he called the cruel extermination of one-third of the people during the Holocaust. Now, later drafters cut most of this. All that would be left of pre-modern history 
would be that the Jews were forcibly exiled from their land. Of course, there would be mention of the, quote, catastrophe which recently befell the Jewish people, the massacre of millions of Jews in Europe. But both of these disasters, the dispersal and the Holocaust, would be portrayed as backdrops to an intensified longing to return to the land. Yes, the Jews were exiled, but the people, and I'm quoting, in every successive generation, never ceased to pray and hope for their return and for the restoration of their political freedom. And the same with the remnant of Jewry in Europe, um, those who had survived the Holocaust. They, and I quote again, never ceased to assert their right to a life of dignity, freedom, and honest toil in their national homeland. Never ceased, never ceased to pray, to hope, to assert their right. This is the recurring theme of the Declaration when it came to the history of the Jews. But these rationales, while persuasive for Jews, wouldn't necessarily persuade the world. And in the end, the later drafts focused more on the world. That's because even if the Jews, in the past, had been exiled and mistreated and more recently exterminated, this didn't necessarily point to a Jewish state. After all, the Holocaust meant that there were fewer Jews to populate a state. So maybe a state wasn't necessary after all, especially if it meant provoking Arab rage. It's often said that the, the Holocaust led to the creation of Israel. But Ben-Gurion thought that the Holocaust threatened to obviate the need for a Jewish state altogether. That the people for whom a Jewish state had been designed were gone anyway, so why should the world go to all the trouble? So while it would be important to emphasize historic rights and evoke the Holocaust, that wouldn't be enough. Even as the drafters shifted words from one rationale to the other, the Truman administration was backtracking on a Jewish state. The State Department took the position that partition was unworkable and so the mandate should be supplanted by a UN trusteeship. It would take more than a catalog of historical rights and grievances to persuade American opinion that its own policy experts were mistaken. So a different rationale had to be emphasized and in Shertok's draft it became clear. First, there was a yeshuv that was ready for statehood and primed to fight for it. And second, the Jewish state had an international license granted by the United Nations the previous November, and it was irrevocable. The case for the state-sustaining, self-sustaining capacity of the Yeshuv is made strongly in the paragraph that hails the pioneers, immigrants, and defenders, who, and I quote, made the desert bloom, revived the Hebrew language, built villages and towns, and created a thriving community controlling its own economy and culture, loving peace but knowing how to defend itself, bringing the blessings of progress to all the country's inhabitants, and aspiring towards independent nationhood. Now, this was a fairly straightforward claim, and it echoed the findings of the UN Commission, known as UNSCOP, that had recommended partition in 1947. UNSCOP, had called the Yeshuv, and I quote the report, a highly organized and closely knit society which, partly on the basis of communal effort, has created a national life distinctive enough to merit the title of a state within a state. And in case there was any doubt, the declaration claimed that the Yeshuv during the World War that had just ended had, and I quote it, by the blood of its soldiers and its war effort, gain the right to be reckoned among the peoples who founded the United Nations. So the Yeshuv had already fielded soldiers in a war effort. And if they had had a state, it would have been a founding member of the United Nations. The strongest single argument for the Jewish state was the fact that to all intents and purposes, it already existed. As Abba Ibn put it, by 1947, the Yeshuv was, and I quote him, too large to be dominated by Arabs, too self-reliant to be confined by tutelage, and too ferociously resistant to be thwarted in its main ambition. 
The other argument, still fresh in memory, was the dramatic vote that took place in the United Nations meeting in Flushing Meadows, New York, on November 29, 1947. It was then and there that the General Assembly, by a two-thirds vote, recommended a plan for independent Arab and Jewish states and a special international regime for the city of Jerusalem, which would arise two months after the British evacuation, but no later than October 1st, 1948. This is what is called the 1947 uh, Partition Resolution. And Zionist diplomacy had worked full bore to secure it while the Arabs had tried to stop it. When the resolution passed, the Yishuv hailed it as the greatest Zionist achievement since the Balfour Declaration of 1917. And it's remembered as a great Zionist achievement to this day. This past November was the 70th anniversary of that vote. Um, and the Israeli UN mission in New York made a huge event of it, including a reenactment of the vote where it had originally taken place, which today it's the Queen's Museum. Mike Pence spoke there, and Israel's US, UN ambassador, Danny Danon, described that vote as recognizing the right to a Jewish state in our homeland. Even today, Israel works hard to remind the world that in November 1947, the UN General Assembly licensed the establishment of a Jewish state. But in April and May 1948, things looked a little different. And there was a debate in the leadership of the Yeshuv as to whether to rely on the UN resolution. Ben-Gurion and many others harbored deep reservations about aspects of the UN plan. According to the recommendation, Jerusalem, which was home to 100,000 Jews, a sixth of the Yeshuv, would be placed under some sort of international regime. And the dream of a state in all of Palestine would have to be shelved, since half of the country was slated to become an Arab state. True, the mainstream Zionist leadership accepted the plan in its totality, but the attitude was well expressed by David Ben-Gurion years later, and I quote him. We were resigned in 1947 to receiving the rump end of Palestine in accordance with the United Nations settlement. We didn't think the settlement very fair since we knew that our work here deserved a greater assignment of land. We didn't, however, press the point and prepare to abide scrupulously to the international ruling come the day of our independence." End of quote. But since the passing of the UN resolution in November, and remember, we're now we're in the spring. Still more had happened, weakening the commitment of the Yishuv to the UN plan. Following the Arab rejection of the plan, the Arabs had launched a civil war against the Jews, and in the course of it, the Jews soon got the upper hand. So much so, they had taken territory allotted to the Arab state, areas which had become bases for Arab attacks against the Yishuv. Most notably, this included Jaffa, just minutes from the meeting place of the People's Administration in Tel Aviv. So things were in flux. Perhaps it would be possible to step back from total acceptance of the UN plan. True, all of, the just, of all the justifications for declaring the Jewish state, the UN vote had the most weight in the world because the world had already accepted it. In any declaration of independence, it would have to be mentioned. But could the UN resolution be invoked in such a way that would legitimize the Jewish state, but not bind that state to all of the provisions in the UN plan. In particular, would it be possible to get out of the straitjacket of the partition map? Now, one can read the declaration for what it contains. One can read the declaration for what it omits. One can also read it for what the drafts contained, but was then omitted. So strong was the attachment to the UN resolution, that early drafts, the early drafts, not only invoked it, they called it a partition plan, and they pledged to uphold the map. Ben-Gurion, who was ever vigilant lest the declaration overcommit Israel, blocked both. And this is how. On May 12th, two days before the declaration, the People's Administration took up this question. What sort of reference should be made to the UN 
partition plan in the Declaration. For instance, would the Jewish state be declared in the framework of the plan? In the framework of the plan? That would be the form most likely to win international recognition for the new state, but it also posed a dilemma. A declaration of total adherence to the UN plan would imply acceptance of the map. On the other hand, a declaration that the state was established only on the basis of the UN plan would imply a diminished commitment to that map. Should the Jews seek to reassure the international community that they weren't bent on expansion? Or should they prepare the case for possible annexation of additional territory? The Berlin-born Felix Rosenblatt, later Pinchas Rosen, was a member of the People's Administration. A jurist, he would later become Israel's first minister of justice. Portfolio he would hold three times. As we've already seen, in April he'd assumed responsibility for drafting a declaration of statehood. He was the one who assigned the task to Behem in the first instance. In the May 12th session, Rosenblatt insisted that the state be declared in the framework of the UN partition plan and that its borders be defined accordingly. As a matter of law, he contended, and I quote him, it is impossible not to treat borders. He'd also distributed in advance a proposed draft of the declaration in which the People's Council, and I quote, declares a free sovereign Jewish state in the borders set forth in the resolution of the UN General Assembly of November 29, 1947. Bechor Shalom Shitrit, a lawyer and judge and a future minister of police, supported Rosenblatt with a legal argument of his own, and I quote him, regarding borders, I agree with Rosenblatt. It's not credible to declare an authority without defining its scope. This can draw us into complications. What the state publishes is the law in the territory of the state. When a state arises, it declares the limits of its borders." End of quote. Now, in a previous lecture, I noted that Ben-Gurion didn't devote a great deal of time to preparing the declaration. But he had to stay engaged, precisely because he couldn't rely on others to appreciate the full political implications of their formulas. The drafting had been turned over to lawyers, for better or worse, and here was exactly the kind of over-lawyering that Ben-Gurion was on guard to check. Rosenblatt's team was about to put Israel in a geographic straitjacket from which it had already managed to wiggle free and throw away the hard-earned gains of weeks of battle as well as the prospect of gaining a foothold in Jerusalem. So Ben-Gurion responded in force. In a rebuttal, which was described by one witness as trenchant, Ben-Gurion took strong exception to the arguments of Rosenblatt and Shitrit. And I quote him, if we decide not to say borders, then we won't say it. To begin with, there was no legal requirement to specify them. And here he drew a comparison already familiar to us, and I quote him, this is a declaration of independence. For example, there is the American Declaration of Independence. It includes no mention of territorial definitions. There is no need and no law such as that. I, too, learned from law books that a state is made up of territory and population. Every state has borders. But we're talking about a declaration of independence and whether borders must or mustn't be mentioned. I say there is no law such as that. In, in a declaration establishing a state, there is no need to specify the territory of the state." End of quote. And then Ben-Gurion went further. The UN, by doing nothing to implement its plan, and the Arabs, by declaring war on the new state, had torn up the UN map. In these circumstances, expansion beyond the partition borders would be entirely legitimate. And I quote Ben-Gurion again. Why not mention borders? Because we don't know what will happen. If the UN stands its ground, we won't fight the UN. But if the UN doesn't act, and the Arabs wage war against us, and we thwart them, and then we take the Western Galilee and both sides of the corridor to Jerusalem, which were to have been part of the Arab state, all this will become part of the Jewish state, if we have sufficient force. Why commit ourselves? End of quote.
Ben Gurion then did something that he hadn't done during the rest of the session. He called for a vote. Who favors including the issue of the borders in the Declaration? Four raised their hand. And who is opposed? Five. Resolved, read the minutes, not to include the issue of the borders in the Declaration. It was the narrowest of margins. And one vote could have tilted it the other way. So why did Ben Gurion call for a vote? It's a matter of conjecture. Uh, clearly, he thought that the issue was of cardinal importance. He probably also thought that he had to break the momentum built by Rosenblatt, who was a formidable legal authority. And it wasn't just Rosenblatt. The Jewish agency had reassured foreign governments that the new state wouldn't deviate from the partition map. As the U.S. consul in Jerusalem reported the following day, May 13th, and I quote him, Jewish agency officials have steadfastly maintained their intention to remain within the UN boundaries. Now, if this intention were to make its way into Israel's foundational document, it would be impossible to amend it later. Israel would have condemned itself by its own hand. Where exactly might the Jewish state seek to amend the borders stipulated by the partition plan? Ben Gurion mentioned the inclusion of the Jerusalem Corridor and the Western Galilee, but these were only two examples. In later years, in recalling his rationale, he emphasized its more general character. And I quote him, I said, let's assume that during the war we captured Jaffa, Ramla, Lida, the Jerusalem Corridor, and the Western Galilee, and that we want to hold on to them. Well, it just so happens that we did take these places. So Ben Gurion wanted to vote as a license to incorporate any strategically vital territory seized in war with an Arab aggressor. The May 12th decision thus set Israel on a course to replace the partition map with another map. And the vote was an achievement in which Ben Gurion took pride. Whenever telling the story, he would always make sure to mention that while his own law studies had been aborted by war in 1914, he had prevailed over the jurist Rosenblatt and the judge Schitrit. It was as though he wanted to show that by his superior foresight and legal reasoning, he'd saved Israel from being forever trapped in the partition map, trapped by its own top lawyers. In the early afternoon of May 14th, Ben-Gurion presented the final draft of the Declaration of Statehood for approval by the People's Council. Mention of the partition borders had disappeared from the draft. But the decision to omit them had been carried by a narrow vote. And there was some chance that the issue might become a bone of contention in the larger body. To forestall that, Ben-Gurion placed an unexpected spin on the May 12th decision, the decision of the previous day. And I quote him, there was a proposal in the People's Administration to determine borders. And there was opposition to this proposal. We decided to sidestep this question, and I use this word deliberately, for a simple reason. If the UN upholds its resolutions and commitments and keeps the peace and prevents bombing and implements its resolution forcefully, we, for our part, and I speak on behalf of the entire people, will respect all of its resolutions. Until now, the UN hasn't done so, and the matter has fallen to us. Therefore, not everything obligates us, and we left this issue open. We didn't say no to the UN borders, but we also didn't say the opposite. We left the question open to developments." End of quote. This is a masterstroke of wording. The question of whether to commit to the partition borders in the Declaration hadn't been sidestepped at all. It had been decided by a vote. But the vote itself substituted ambiguity for certainty, because until May 12, the state-in-waiting had been committed to the partition map. After May 12, that commitment depended on the UN doing something it should have done, but hadn't done, and likely wouldn't do. Ben Goyan had created a new consensus of the entire people, as he said, that the partition map might be revised. And so when Ben Goyan read the declaration, the borders had gone missing. There is an American aspect to this story. The world had been led to expect that Israel would fill only the space on the map allotted by the partition plan. Washington was no exception. 
As Jewish statehood drew near, the U.S. government sought reassurances. On May 13th, the Jewish agency's ambassador to Washington, Eliyahu Epstein, the name was later changed to Eilat, received a phone call from Clark Clifford, special counsel to the president, President Truman, and a keen supporter of Zionism. Clifford was working to persuade Truman to recognize the Jewish state immediately upon its birth. He instructed Epstein, to write formally to Truman and to ask for U.S. recognition as soon as the state was declared. Clifford would later recall telling Epstein that, and I quote him, it was particularly important that the new state claim nothing beyond the boundaries outlined in the U.N. resolution of November 29, 1947, because those boundaries were the only ones which had been agreed to by everyone, including the Arabs in any international forum. This was an odd claim because the Arabs hadn't accepted the Jewish state in any borders. But the expectation from the Jewish state was clear enough. So in Epstein's letter to Truman, go back to Epstein's letter to Truman, seeking recognition, he informed the president that Israel had been declared, and I quote him, within frontiers approved by the General Assembly. Washington's de facto recognition of Israel followed almost immediately. Now, in reality, The state of Israel hadn't been declared in any borders. And this gave its critics a basis for later claims that the United States had been misled into recognizing the state based on a false representation. But Epstein had no knowledge that Ben-Gurion had shifted Israel's position. Amid the political and practical preparations for the declaration, Tel Aviv was turned upside down. And Epstein had no contact with Shertok, his superior. He would apologize to share talk later that day for writing to Truman on his own accord without prior consultation. So Israel received American recognition as a state without borders, although the Americans may have assumed otherwise. That no one but Ben-Gurion could be relied upon to see things that clearly was demonstrated the next week. Now the Declaration's lack of a reference to borders didn't pass unnoticed at the United Nations. And Abba Iban, then representing the new state, thought that that should be fixed. On May 24th, he messages Shertok from New York, and I quote the cable, Ambiguity and independence proclamation regarding frontiers much commented by delegations and exploited by opponents, possibly delaying recognition and restricting those received. We urge official statement defining frontiers of Israel in accordance with the November 1947 UN resolution. And this was Abba Iban, no less, the man who had become Israel's most famous champion in the world. Needless to say, his plea fell on deaf ears, fortunately so, as most Israelis would agree. By the end of the war, Israel's territory had grown from 55% of mandatory Palestine, which was its share under the partition plan, to 78%. That is, it grew by nearly 50%, which included West Jerusalem, a corridor leading to Jerusalem, the southern approaches to Tel Aviv, including Jaffa, Lida, Ramla, the whole of the Galilee, and parts of the Negev. It has been said that while the Declaration doesn't commit Israel to borders, it does commit Israel to the principle of partition. According to the UN plan, there were to be two states, Jewish and Arab, and an economic union between them. And there is an article in the Declaration that reads as follows. The State of Israel is prepared to cooperate with the agencies and representatives of the United Nations in implementing the resolution of the General Assembly of 29th November 1947 and will take steps to bring about the economic union of the whole of Eretz Yisrael. But this article too underwent revision. As late as Shertok's draft, the UN plan was described by its official name. The plan of partition of Palestine with economic union. Ben-Gurion in the session session of May 13th said to delete the reference to partition. He says, why should we mention partition, he said. And so the word partition disappeared from the declaration. The declaration does emphasize that the UN had passed a resolution, and I quote it, passed a resolution calling for the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel. It even insisted that that decision was irrevocable. But to read the declaration, one might conclude that the General Assembly had voted only in favor of one state, a Jewish one. 
which would pursue by itself the economic union of the whole country. Why did Ben-Gurion want to keep the word partition out of the declaration? After all, he had supported partition in 1937 when it was recommended by a British royal commission. And again in 1947, Ben-Gurion banished the word to make the declaration acceptable to the revisionist, to the revisionist right, uh, who might resist signing a document with the word partition in it. And just to show how sensitive to it they were, Consider the complaint of the uh, revisionist Herzl Rosenblum, also known as Vardy. You remember him. He's the poor fellow who ended up signing his name as dictated to him by Ben-Gurion. In the People's Council meeting on the morning of the declaration, um, he spoke up about the draft article I just quoted, about the economic union. And he said he was aware that everything possible had been done to avoid mentioning partition in the declaration. But he was still worried. Why? Israel in the Declaration said it would take steps to bring about the economic union of the whole of Eretz Israel. Now perhaps this could be construed as acceptance of partition. After all, what was to be unified economically if not two separate entities? To mention economic union was a bit risky. It could be read, he said, as acceptance of the principle of partition. Now Shertok gave him a very peculiar answer. When I quote him, it's one or the other. Either we rest on the UN decision or we don't. If we do rest on it, we have to rest on all its principal parts. In the resolution, there is an explicit condition for the Jewish state and the Arab state to earn UN recognition. It must be clear that it is prepared to enter into an economic union. End of quote. But in fact, that wasn't Ben Gurion's position. His position was precisely that it wasn't one or the other, that Israel could play up the UN recognition of the Jewish right to the state, and pretty much ignore or finesse the rest of the UN resolution. So Israel would ignore the partition map and finesse the economic union. It wasn't hard, since no Arab state had arisen anyway. And as we see today, the economic integration of the whole country doesn't require that there be two states. In the May 13th meeting of the People's Administration, which reviewed Shertok's draft, some of the members complained that it was too full of justifications. Mordechai Bentov of Mapam thought then, and I quote him, it would be better if it were shorter. In my opinion, there's not much of such a need to explain ourselves in our right. It was enough, he said, to say two principal things. We have a historic right, and we have the right of a free people to live in its homeland. So much detail weakens the declaration. In particular, he didn't like all the references to international decisions. And I quote him, It makes no sense in this historic moment to base everything on this or that provision of the mandate or the UN resolution. Our historic right drowns in a multitude of passages, and I don't find an expression of the natural right of a people to a free life in our homeland. And Rabbi Fishman agreed. He quoted the Talmud. Only that which is unclear requires many proofs. Ben Goyen agreed that Shertok's draft was too long, and he cut it that night. But the changes were mostly stylistic, and he was careful to leave the core justifications, including the references to the UN plan. The United Nations, in fact, appears in six separate paragraphs of the Declaration. Ben Goyen would later claim that the UN had done nothing to establish the state, that the state came into being by force of arms alone, that the UN resolution was a dead letter. In 1949, when he moved Israel's capital to Jerusalem, he declared the 1947 UN resolution void. But that was after the war. On May 14, 1948, Israel's founders wanted to emphasize to the world that while the Jewish people was born in Eretz Yisrael, the state was the adopted child of the United Nations. Israel had a natural and historic right to exist and that right had been recognized by the world. Nothing made that point more clearly than the crucial passage in the Declaration. By virtue of our natural and historic right, and on the strength of the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly, we hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel to be known as the State of Israel. And yet it would be a mistake to think that the United Nations created 
the State of Israel. If it were within the power of the UN to create states, then an Arab state would have arisen in 1948 alongside Israel. The Arabs of Palestine had exactly the same recognition of their rights and license to act as those granted to the Jews. The difference was that they didn't constitute a state within a state. I've made much use in these lectures of the protocols of the People's Administration and the People's Council. Both were established by the Zionist executive precisely to bring together all the factions into a nascent government and parliament. The Jews had made common cause and created the institutions needed to translate their rights and recognition into statehood. The Arabs of Palestine had nothing comparable. Indeed, their elites were already in full flight from the country. The most impressive part of the Israeli declaration, perhaps, is the simplest. We, members of the People's Council, by affixing their signatures in alphabetical order on the proclamation that established Israel, they created the state on behalf of the people. And that concludes this lecture. Herzl, Weizmann, Jabotinsky, Ben-Gurion, they all championed the liberal idea that Zionism did not negate the individual and collective national rights of Arabs. <laughs>